Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. In this episode, I interview Dr. Burton Tamer and Heather Wright. Burton Tamer is the director of CRA's Center for Evaluating the Research Pipeline, or CERP for short. She oversees CERP's operations and various initiatives that involve research, evaluation, and community engagement in support of broadening participation in computing. Heather Wright serves as the Associate Director of the Center. In her role, Wright leads SERP's evaluation efforts aimed at broadening participation in computing and education. Wright also coordinates SERP's various research initiatives and supports the continued sustainability of the Center. In this episode, we discuss SERP's ongoing projects and the benefits of diversity in computing. Enjoy! So you're listening to Catalyze and Computing, here today with Birch and Tamer and Heather Wright, respectively the director and associate director of CRA's Center for Evaluating the Research Pipeline, or SERP for short. Um, so thank you guys for being here. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. So what is SERP and what is its mission? Um. Well, SERP is um, a, one of the committees of CRA, so um, and it's a cen- center for um, evaluation and research. Um, so we do evaluation and research uh, primarily, um, and we can tell you more about how we do that. And the mission, so the formal mission statement says uh, that SERP's mission is to increase diversity in the field of computing research through evaluation and research. So, um, and an extension of our mission is to be just a general resource for the community. So anything that we do is essentially to, in that, in service to being a uh, resource for the community. Okay. And how does SERP get its funding? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, SERP is, uh, primarily funded through federal grants. Um, So that's how it was established and um, currently still uh, continues to be funded by uh, federal grants, primarily uh, the National Science Foundation um, and uh, for various projects, there are separate awards that we have. Um, But we also have um, some uh, contracts that with other organizations through for evaluation projects. And then, of course, CRA contributes to uh, some of the other activities that SERP does. Okay. Um, So you said SERP's mission is to evaluate the research pipeline. So what does that mean? And can you discuss some ongoing SERP projects? Um, Yeah, sure. So um, what does it mean to evaluate the research pipeline? I guess it kind of goes back to... um, SERP's um, establishment a little bit, um, where, um, of course, CRA's primary focus is on computing research. And um, initially, SERP was um, founded to be able to collect data for um, making that, uh, making it possible to evaluate some programs um, in the uh, computing research area. So um, this... um, will come up a little bit later um, in more detail, but that's kind of the foundation of SERP and that for, that's, uh, I think it's in the mission statement. Um, so SERP has, so like I said, it was established for the evaluation purposes, but since then it's grown quite a bit. And um, therefore we have a lot of different projects um, that we can touch on um, during this conversation. And um, some of these relate to data collection, Others relate to uh, focus on evaluation, but then also we have some uh, projects that are more directed towards community engagement as well. Okay. Um, So where do you get the data you collect from? I know one of your major projects is the Data Buddies project. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I'm happy to chime in about Data Buddies. So um, the Data Buddies project is kind of our flagship project. Um, as Borsha mentioned, we were um, SERP was formed to 
uh, do program evaluation, and that's where Data Buddies came along. Um, the CRAW, so the Committee on um, Widening Participation in Computing, the, before they were CRAW, um, and the Coalition for Diversifying in, uh, Computing, they had um, formed an alliance, and through that alliance, they were like, we need um, program evaluation, we need to assess how our programs are doing, and what's the impact on the participants. Um, so in 2010, they piloted what's called the Data Buddy Survey, um, and what would, what's been running, um, you know, since, since then. And so if recently we had uh, highlighted 10 years of the project. So of course this year, um, it's, it's more than, than 10 years, but last year was kind of our 10th year of data collection. And, um, so we highlighted some of the, uh, responses that we've gotten over the years and it's grown quite a bit, uh, back in the days, whenever, the Data Buddies project was just a pilot initiative. We had 10 institutions that worked with us, um, and I'm happy to talk about that in just a moment. But um, so 10 institutions worked with us, and today that we have over 160 institutions that now um, work with us for Data Buddies project. And when I say work with us, that means um, that they distribute the survey on our behalf to their students. And um, as students take the survey, we get a lot of different information that relates to programs that they participate in. So that's in service of that evaluation component that we've mentioned. But then also just to kind of give us some insights into what the field, what the field looks like, um, how students um, perceive their department and those experiences, so such as like core sizes. Um, and by participating in the project, um, we provide the departments with a report. So they'll see their student uh, responses alongside a comparison group. So if it's a PhD granting institution, then their comparison group is um, other PhD granting institutions, and that's across all of the data buddies um, that are part of the project. Um, so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, that's kind of the project in a nutshell. Of course, there's a lot of detail, a lot of things that we do with, um, with the data, such as our infographics, and we do different publications and um, other evaluation reports, but um, that's kind of the project in a nutshell. Okay. So this this project really helps academic departments evaluate their sort of cohorts in comparison to the broader spectrum of other computing departments in the US. Right, right. And and if they're interested in different types of analysis, so there are departments that are particularly interested in understanding the experiences of their um majors and those that are not majors, but they all end up funneling into computing in some way, say at the introductory course level. Um, so if that's something that they're interested in, then we can do that additional type of analysis for them. So the, the way we view the comparison groups is the default is by institution type, but then if there are additional comparisons that would help better inform their um, understanding of student experiences, then we work with them and do additional type of analyses. Okay, that sounds very useful. Um, so are there any interesting recent insights that you've, you've gained from the data buddies project you want to talk about? Um, the, uh, we have the SERP infographics that we published. So I've mentioned that, uh, recently. So we publish these infographics every month, um, through the computing research news. So that's a publication of the, of the CRA, of course, as you know, but, um, I hope that your audience also knows that as well. Um, so we're actively working on infographics every month, and sometimes we um, we focus on different types of research topics. Um, oftentimes, we think about a uh, student sense of belonging, so understanding if there are differences in, by gender or by disability status, and um, all of those results can be found on our on our website. And they, they go back from when SERP was founded in 2013 as a as a formal research center. Um, one of the more recent infographics we've produced were kind of highlighting the responses that we've collected over um, over the years from 2013 into the last year. So the infographics, you'll see data like that, just kind of seeing the responses over time. Um, but another example is um, seeing where computing professionals and what, if they're in industry or they're in academia, how they think about computing careers. So um, actually, Fortune uh, had done this infographic recently, and of course, uh, audience can go check this out. But um, so she was looking at what do professionals um, in industry and academia believe like a computing career could afford them to do, and 
Um, so we look at being able to serve humanity, being in a position of influence in society, um, spending time with family. These are things that we look at as um, this kind of career affordances. So what people value as part of their career. And she found some differences there um, for what people in academia view as far as what's important for them in their career versus what's in industry. Um, and industry folks tend to value a little bit more um, spending time with family, whereas in academia, just a little bit more higher ratings on serving humanity and having a position of influence in society. Um, so that's just like a touch point on some of the results that we do, but we try to do a wide range of analyses using the Data Buddies data. And the infographics really allow us to have these little quick touch points so that we can get information like that out to the community without doing a full research paper, which we try to do, but um, with time and all the projects that we have, like Fortune described, um, these infographics really allow us to get more information out. Right. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting insight. I mean, it kind of makes sense, but um, I wonder what implications it has for society. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but there will be links on the podcast website to, to find all of this stuff. Um, so for people that are interested, uh, how could they get involved with Data Buddies if they're in a computing department at a university? Um, so good thing you asked. Um, in the last month or two, we have worked really hard to overhaul our Data Buddies website. Um, so if they go to cra.org forward slash SERP, forward slash data buddies, which of course the links will be available. Um, we have a lot of information about the project and in one area, actually throughout the, throughout the website, um, there are opportunities to sign up for the project. Um, so there's a, a simple form that they would complete. Uh, we like to get information about who's the department chair, how many students they have. Um, but it's, it's a very simple, straightforward form. And then it takes a few days to get that processed. And after any questions or are handled, then, um, you know, we start the onboarding process. So it's it's quick and easy. And I don't think I've actually mentioned this, but it's really important to say that Data Buddies is free. So if, you know, anyone is part is not part of the project yet and would like to get involved and get a free report, the, the entire project for, for our Data Buddies is free. And of course, that has funding from the National Science Foundation to make that possible. And so we encourage you to check out the website to learn more um, more about it and sign up. Yeah, definitely got to highlight that it's free. Um, for sure. <laughs> uh, so I know you're also very involved with evaluating CRAWP, which is the subcommittee of CRA focused on widening participation in computing. Uh, you're very involved in doing evaluations of their, uh, events and projects. Um, do you have any notable results from evaluating their activities? Um, yeah, I can I can start with that. And Borchin, if you want to chime in, um, feel free to to talk more um, about that. So you're right in that we have uh, worked with CRAWP activities and programs for a long time, and um, you know with, with with their support, we've been able to do as much as we as we have. Um, so I I think for this um, topic one thing that I can highlight is with CRAWP programs, um, we have multiple methods of doing evaluation. So there, are, for certain programs, we'll just collect feedback, and then that informs the program organizers about how the event was running. Um, we also try to do immediate impact um, analysis on the program. So what we typically do is have like a pre and a post survey. Um, so then that we can measure before the program begins. So we can, we'll oftentimes think of that as being the intervention program. We measure um, where where participants are before the program, then they have the, then they participate in the workshop, for example, the career mentoring workshops, which are for professionals in the field. So they're not students. Um, but the purpose of that is to help them understand where they are right now in their career pathway and then what they need to do to move to the next level. Um, so after that happens, they get all this great mentorship support. Um, there are networking events. Um, then after that event, then we'll uh, issue the kind of the same survey. It'll look a little bit different depending on um, what we put together. But uh, by having some of the same measures, we can understand if anything changed over an immediate time frame. Um, and we'll do that type of analysis um, and showcase that to the organizers. Like, okay, thinking about... Um, participants' vision for their career. In the case of career mentoring workshops, 
Um, how, where did they come in at the beginning of knowing the steps that they need to take to move up in their career ladder? And then we measure it again and like, okay, we can see that there was a significant difference in the way that people had reported these measures. And um, with the analysis that we do, the results are connected to, to each person over time so that we can more accurately say um, that these results are significant for the people who are um, in the participant list. So we have seen these significant results for the career mentoring workshops. It seems like the um, event really does help people um, understand better their vision for their career. Um, and one important thing to note is, you know, while we have these immediate impact um, analyses, uh, which kind of help the organizers, again, know, like, what are the key areas that have really benefited the participants and what are other areas that they could um, gr provide greater support for? Um, SERP has um, the ability to do long-term analysis and long-term impact. And for career mentoring workshops, we've done some of that type of analysis. And with uh, thinking about the participants in the career mentoring workshop, I think for this analysis, we looked at uh, participants from like 20, uh, 2008 and 2009. Um, we were able to call a comparison group of similar uh, women who got their PhD at the same time. So these are, pe are people who could have attended the workshops but didn't. So several different criteria that went into creating these comparison groups. And then with uh, our surveys, we were able to see that the um, program participants were further along in their career. So they were more likely at a mid or senior level um, position in their career compared to the comparison group that were a little bit um, not as far behind. Uh, hold on. That were a little bit further behind in their career pathway. We'll have to cut that. Um, okay. So, with all of this put together, uh, we can provide a lot of different insights to program organizers and people running workshops like the career mentoring workshops, where we have this pre-post analysis paired with some feedback and then the long-term analysis to understand what, what are the greater impacts that these workshops can have on participants. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, in the example you gave about comparing people who didn't attend career mentoring workshops to those who did... Um, I guess how much of that do you think, maybe you don't know, but how much of this do you think was causation of attending the workshops versus correlation between other factors that would affect who might be interested in attending these workshops? If that makes sense. It it does make sense. I, that's a great question. And we get that often because there, there can be some, uh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head the, the exact word. The, the people who attend the workshop may be more likely to have already been um, highly motivated individuals. And um, so it's a little bit harder for us to control. Um, but, you know, with the way that we pared down the comparison groups, we tried to make them as comparable as possible. Um, uh, fortunately for all of us, uh, Fortune actually was the one who worked really heavily on that project and called the comparison group. So, Fortune, maybe you have a little bit more insight that um, that you could provide on this that um, could help us out. Um, yeah. So, with um, in a lot of social science, uh, statistical analysis is going to be correlational. So, we're doing making inferences from correlations that we find at the end of the day. Um, in some ideal circumstances, you could do a um, like a controlled experiment, but in our case, it would be almost unethical to do a controlled experiment <laughs> where we accept certain participants and not others just to be able to figure out whether they whether the program worked or not. So, in in this particular case for the career mentoring workshops, we actually tried to come up with a, a good method of finding a comparison group that's um, sort of randomly selected. So we literally went and um, looked at uh, the list of a lot of people who got their PhDs in that time period, um, the same time period that the participants had, and um, randomly selected people. So hopefully um, that adds a little bit of um, kind of ability to say, okay, you know, um, these people weren't sort of systematically outside of the program. Like they weren't, they didn't apply and didn't attend or you know, uh, so I guess it's a, it's one of those things where we can't 
get out there and say, yeah, 100%, this is what the program did. Especially because when you consider this, uh, at the time that we did this analysis, I think um, this was 2016, so about eight years out of the program, more than likely these people had other activities during that time. You know, it, it, the MW wasn't the only thing they did. So, um, we, yeah, at, you know, at the end we're just talking about correlations, causations is more of a we would need a lot more and a lot, um, you know, adv more advanced analysis to try to figure that out. But sometimes we, of course, um, try to do like mixed methods to try to interview people and try to understand what um, sort of the more causal mechanisms might be um, for these um, evaluation results as well. Hmm. So if you had an unlimited budget and unlimited staff, uh, what would you want to set up to be able to maybe try and figure out more of those causal relationships? Is there anything? This is a, a great question, right? So, um, first of all, uh, one of the other questions we get that is kind of connected to this is, okay, what is your sample representative? So could we potentially collect more data we could. Uh, we could provide more incentives for students or professionals, whoever we're surveying, to fill out the survey um, or reach more people uh, through outreach and other, other kinds of things. Uh, if we had more researchers, we could um, do more effective um, sort of mixed method research where, you know, more time could be spent interviewing people or doing focus groups to kind of ground the survey questions and the analysis a little bit more. Um, but uh, that's uh, that kind of, I think, funding would be really, really difficult to have uh, the amount of staff that it would require is uh, enormous, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I know you recently got a contract to uh, evaluate NSF REUs. So what are the REUs and um, what kind of evaluations will you guys be doing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we were really excited about that contract. So um, the the work that we're going to be doing is evaluating the NSF um, research experiences for undergraduates. So that's what RU um, stands for. And NSF has had this longstanding RU um, program where they offer awards for um, PIs and faculty to run uh, what are called RU sites. Um, so I like to think of these as um, like a research lab that students come together during a summer period. Um, and typically they're in teams of eight to 10 students. Um, the faculty member has a um, project that they all work on. And then as a team, they, they, um, they work on their projects over the course of the summer. And there are a lot of different opportunities that the students are provided through an REU site. Um, and NSF has several different um, areas of support for students that are required um, to have through this RU site. So we so we have these, these summer programs that are um, part of the RU program. Then uh, NSF also issues um, supplemental funding to uh, support RU students. So we think of these as RU supplements. Um, and the RU supplements can be awarded at any time, or they can be through the main solicitation for um, the RU program. People who run RU sites might have supplemental funding to include additional students during the summer. They could also be just working on a, a technical research proposal uh, during just an academic year to, um, you yeah, know, they want to bring on an undergraduate student. So that student works with them, say, during a fall semester or throughout the course of the year. Um, so there's a little bit more variance for the RU supplements as there are with the sites, but for our contract, we'll be providing evaluation um, about the NSF RU program. Um, and, and to clarify, this is for size, so the Director of Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering. Um, the RU program is across NSF, so our, our specific focus is on the size side of things. Um, so through our evaluation efforts, we're going to uh, be doing a, I, I think of this as mixed methods. Not in terms of a mix of qualitative and quantitative data research, but in our approach to um, conducting the evaluation. Um, and I think it's a bridge between how we 
do things for the Data Buddies project and how we do things for, say, CRWP programs that we talked about earlier. Um, so if we think about our work in terms of a typical summer, um, but we can, of course, this will apply to the supplements that are working over a semester or two semesters, uh, we'll survey the participants at the beginning of their experience. So for easier context, we'll think about it as a summer. So before the summer begins, they'll get a survey. And the, the survey will be um, aligned as best as it can with data bodies, but of course it'll include some measures specifically related to the RU experience so we can do a better tracking of, of, um, of their perceptions of the summer. Uh, then at the end of the summer, we're gonna send them a similar survey. It'll uh, be changed just a little bit to collect some feedback, um, but we're hoping to gauge their, um, their perspectives of their skill sets and how much experience they gained over the course of the semester. And we'll see how that, that compared from the beginning of the summer to where they, they land at the end of the summer. Um, the connection to data bodies is that we'll have our, our list of, of RU sites, or RU supplements that work with us, and we'll use a communication method very similar to data buddies. So if any of the faculty member at RU programs um, also are part of the Data Buddies project, then they'll be familiar with how that system will look like um, with our communications and reaching out and providing survey links. Um, but if they're not, then that's okay. We'll guide them through that process and provide as much information as we can. So that's the core of it for our evaluation structure. But one cool thing that we're going to be doing through this contract is doing additional follow-up. So a year after their experience, we're going to follow up with the participants and see if the NSFRU had any lasting impacts. We don't know what that'll look like yet, so we're really excited to be able to dig in and see what we find. <laughs> yeah, that sounds interesting. We'll have to have a uh, an update in a year or yes. two. Yes, I'll look forward to it. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned something about communications methods. I guess what communications methods do you all rely on currently? Have you found any sort of best practices that helps to... Uh, increase response rates to, to your surveys and, and projects? Well, I will say that reminders have been key for us. Um, one of the things that I think is great about SERP is that we do have the capacity and infrastructure to have uh, reminders at scheduled times. So even if we're relying on, say, a PI or a department to send out surveys on our behalf, we have periods where we make an effort to request reminders. And if they need help sending those out, then we do the best that we can to, um, to reach the students um, or participants, depending on what's, what the program is. Um, in other evaluation efforts where we have access to participant lists, um, we'll do our own reminders. And I like to just set those up right at the beginning after I've sent the survey out and I try to touch base with the um, survey responded at least twice after that. Um, so, I mean, in our case, we think that reminders really make a difference. Of course, incentives are also really nice. Um, you have to be able to get them to open up the email and actually read that there's an incentive. Um, <laughs> but, you know, lots of times uh, the incentives are, are really uh, useful. There's, there's research out there about how much you um can provide and is, if you give them $100, does that really make a difference compared to $5, $10, even a single dollar? Um, so it, it, there's a lot of different methods that we've tried, but we do our best to provide incentives that would matter to our survey respondents. We varied that from Amazon gift cards to uh, making donations to an organization that they um, would like us to. So having some sort of structure that shows that their um, their responses were meaningful and we appreciate them, I think is important. Alongside those reminders and those little pings to say, please do this. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would say. Fortune, is there anything you'd want to add on that? Well, I mean, I guess sort of related to reminders, just to kind of, you know, make sure that we are on people's radars. Um, one of the things is, you know, we don't always think about this, but people are actually um, sometimes altruistic in that if we can find a way through the reminders or through some other uh, method uh, channel um, to tell and communicate to them that this survey that they're responding to isn't just 
you know, to respond to a survey. It will actually, we try to do something with it, whether it's providing their department information, then department can make improvements or providing the program organizers information that they can use to then improve the program that they just participated in. So um, we try to kind of include that in the emails to say, you know, your help will um, help us move the field forward in terms of um, whatever the goal of the program is. But then also um, sometimes it helps if, um, say, the department or a faculty member says in the class, hey, you know, heads up, there's this survey coming through. As a department, we sit down and look at this report to help you know, make the department better, um, then students will sometimes um, think about it as, you know, something they do to pay it forward to the people who will come after them to either participate in the program or, or join the department or the major. So um, that helps as well. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so another project I know you all started fairly recently is uh, BPC Net. When did you get that about a year ago? Um, uh, actually, it has been a, a little more than two years at this point. Yeah, I think 2018 was when BPC Net uh, first got its start and we were getting connected. And then, of course, there are some awards attached with that. Okay. Wow. Um, so what is BPC Net and how can people get involved? So <laughs> BPC Net is... Um, Essentially, a website, bpcnet.org, is the, the full address. Um, and it's a resource portal for broadening participation in computing, so BPC. Um, it got its start uh, initially as um, a s- sort of a ma- ways, as a way of supporting uh, faculty and departments um, write what's called BPC plans. So um, to give background on what these are, um, the direct, size directorate um, really cares about broadening participation in computing since it's such an important um, topic. And one of the um, an initiative they started um, is to try to get people involved in the field who are not regularly involved, who are not the usual suspects who work on broadening participation, right? Because each faculty member can contribute to this um, by doing little things, then at scale, we have a better impact and move the needle a little bit further. So um, the way they decided to do this was to um, require the faculty who are submitting proposals to size or certain programs of size um, to submit a plan um, explaining how they will be contributing to writing participation. So it's not for each faculty member to take the you know uh, load of trying to fix uh, issues of diversity in computing, but you know to contribute in some way, no matter how small it is. But of course, for people who haven't been in the space of broadening participation and working on this, like say CIWP is doing for a long, long time, it's it's a mystery. Okay, what is a good way of contributing to this, um, right? So uh, BPCNet was established in order to kind of address that question where, okay, we have all these people who have been working on broadening participation for a long time. Can we help um, deliver some resources to the community in order for them to use uh, what's already available? Um, so BPCNet um, started with providing um, the community access to um, programs that were already established. Um, so the BPC alliances that NSF had um, established uh, early 2000s um, were um, featured there with all the different kinds of programs they do where faculty could come in and say, oh, you know, there's access computing. I could partner with them to do, you know, whatever it is they do, that way my actions would be more meaningful, would be evidence-based, would be uh, evaluated, that's, you know, that sort of thing where um, we can have a real impact. Um, so since starting at this uh, point, BPCNet has grown quite a bit within the past three um, or four years. Um, and um, 
now we have a lot more resources and we're trying to be a kind of a larger resource about broadening participation in general that goes beyond just the BPC plans. Okay. So what kind of other resources are available there? So like Bridget was saying, we, we want to be able to support the communities as much as we can through bpcnet.org. Um, so one really exciting thing that's on the, the website is our statistics and data hub. Um, our colleague Evelyn had put that together, and it's an app where people can download the iPads data. So the computing degree is awarded, and, and that app tailors the data specifically to computing and engineering. So all of the zip codes that institutions report um, so it's tailored there. So then that way departments don't need to go um, to iPads to get that data directly. It's kind of already culled there for them. Um, and it also provides K through 12 data um, as well. So that's one example of what we have on BPCNet um, on the website specifically, but as a, as a resource more broadly, um, we've been working on having these, uh, what we call BPC community calls. And these calls are specifically for bringing people that are working in the space of broadening participation together to talk about what are the things that we've been doing um, as a community. Because um, before these calls, uh, all of the alliances, all of the other different organizations and groups that do a lot of hard work for broadening participation are have been operating in their own spaces. And maybe there has been a little bit of touch points between um, alliances or between organizations, but there hasn't been a mass pulling of the groups together to keep everyone informed of what's going on. So that's why these calls were created in the first place. And that was our service through bpcnet.org to host these calls and bring everyone together. Um, we, we've, they're mostly on a monthly call schedule. Um, sometimes we end up skipping months depending on if there's a particular month where the, the BPC alliances are just extremely busy and it doesn't make sense for us to meet. So we can kind of tailor that experience and then we'll also tailor the topics to what makes the most sense at the time and what's what are some of the issues that are impacting the community um, based on whatever is going on. Um, so we have those calls and we'll be taking that even further given that um, NSF had earlier in the year a, um, a call for solicitation, so a solicitation for the BPC program. Um, alliance, some of the alliances got um, extended funding. There were more projects that um, received funding to get started. So those were called demonstration projects. Um, so we uh, connected to several of the projects that um, were, or the proposals that were submitted through that solicitation and then ultimately funded. Um, so we're going to harness the resources that we've already created through VPCNet um, to further help those projects uh, move their missions forward. Um, and while I'm on the topic of the demonstration projects, uh, the, the CERT team, through our connection through bpcnet.org, um, were one of the groups that had a demonstration project um, awarded. So we had a we submitted a proposal at, with uh, our collaborators at Sagebox Group. So that's a consulting group that they provide evaluation services. Um, similar to what SERP does as well. Um, they have a little bit different focus of what SERP focuses on. So together, uh, we can kind of bring our expertise um, for this project that we received funding for. And that's to um, create some sort of common and shared uh, way and method of, of measuring things, of thinking about different concepts. So for instance, um, access computing, which is a BPC alliance that focuses on um, people with disabilities and supporting um, that group. Uh, they have obviously expertise in um, the space of, uh, of disabilities. And so we as a, as a BPC community should learn from them about what are the best practices in supporting people with disabilities for across all of the programs and events that organizations um, hold the um, the standards of how we create safe spaces and accessible spaces is not always consistent. And we can learn from access computing who has that expertise rather than trying to reinvent the wheel every single time. So, so the goal of this project is to bring um, the key stakeholders from all of these, these groups together and come up with the shared ways of 
of um, best practices related to, say, accessibility, but then also just measures of, you know, we want to run a survey. Who is the go-to um, group to think about, you know, what uh, to get copies of, of surveys or think about measures that we would use? Um, so it's just harnessing the expertise that's already existing in the community and then pulling it into a single place where everyone can access and access it and build upon it. And so VPCNet will provide that space not only for those conversations, but then ultimately any outcomes from that. Um, so we're really excited to start that project with Sage Fox, and um, it's just another way that we support the community through VPCNet. Cool. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Um, so I guess, obviously, uh, broadening participation in, in computing and you know, society in general, I suppose, is important for equity and diversity of thought. But what have you what have you all found um, statistically? What evidence is there for why broadening computing is broadening participation is important? Um, yeah, so like you said, it's obviously important. It's one of those things where if we asked anyone, uh, no one will say, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, and uh, the other thing that is important to also note is um, we can tell only so much with statistical evidence, and this is more an issue of um, individuals' lived experience when you know it comes down to it, and we can measure it all we want, but really um, we can't tell the story as completely as um, uh, the, the actual experience uh, can possibly demonstrate. So, but of course, what statistical evidence does is to uncover patterns and also sometimes convince people that um, this isn't the one person they spoke to or you know, the two people in their course who is um, having trouble, say, connecting with their peers because of um, biases. So, um, so for instance, one of the analysis we have done, so th there are several concepts um, that social scientists and education researchers think about when they think about um, how people persist in various environments. Like for instance, in the case of computing and or just in general, um, education and, and, and uh, being able to uh, go through a career uh, path um, there is um, recruitment of people into, say, computing, and then there is. Um, it, it's important to then uh, keep them there so they're persistent, right? So, and then there are certain factors that um, are found to be associated with um, with these. Um, so one of them is belonging. So a sense of belonging is how individuals feel uh, about an environment they're in, how connected they feel, how welcome they feel in that in a given environment. Um, one of the analyses we have done, and this is something that um, is actually a benefit of the Data Buddies project is because we have large amounts of data, we're able to actually do these types of analysis where we can talk about populations that are currently underrepresented in computing. Because that, that's the um, kind of, I guess, the um, catch-22 of, um, on the representation on lack, lack of diversity, right? Um, if there are only two people in the department, it's really difficult to then go ahead and survey them just in that department and try to figure out what's going on. Whereas um, we can survey large amounts of people and therefore even though there are only say 20% of women in the, in the computing community, we can get to that kind of um, enough of them uh, into the data set to try to um, talk about patterns. Um, so uh, in this case, um, we talked about sense of belonging and looked at um, this particular question that we asked, which is, I feel welcome in computing. So we asked people how much they agree with that statement, how much, how welcome they feel in computing. And we tried to look at this um, by uh, broken down by um, gender, race, ethnicity, and disability status. So um, then a very interesting picture came out of that. Um, this is in one of our infographics, um, which, uh, of course, you can find on the SERP website or in CRN. Um, the, it turned out that there is a really, really large range of um, 
how much how well can people feel so for instance the um if you look at um kind of the the people who felt the least welcome and the most welcome um the they were so the the way we measured this is what percentage of individuals said that they feel welcome in computing in this case um i believe the numbers are uh, about 36 percent of black women said that they felt welcome in computing whereas um 75 percent of white men did so that's a large difference right and that's not a um not something to ignore that we can ignore and say oh yeah you know it's about one one single individual who's having trouble for whatever reason this is clearly something systematic something um structural that we need to change to make sure that um individuals from different types of backgrounds can feel connected to the field and can persist there without having to work harder than others right so um that's kind of one of the striking results that we have found that um demonstrate the importance of broadening participation even though in some ways we shouldn't have to do that to be able to t- demonstrate to people <laughs> that it is important <laughs> hmm. uh maybe you mentioned this when you first started your answer but um is there evidence in the social science that feeling a sense of belonging is important towards having better outcomes or better career success or, or whatever um yeah yeah so that's a uh, uh, that's why we look at those kinds of um concepts and measures because um longitudinal study, studies actually show and some of these um SERP and, and our collaborators have connected also can be found on the SERP website um where um people who feel a higher sense of belonging are more li- likely to actually persist in the field and and continue in their um uh say degree programs undergraduate or graduate um so definitely those are um both the field of psychology um education research everybody and this is widely um kind of research topic that it's uh, relevant to um uh, your success for sure hmm. well uh certainly seems like SERP is providing a valuable service then um is there anything we didn't talk about today that you you want to mention you want to bring up? Uh, is there anything else to say? Well, one thing I'll I'll mention and and it might be a great way to round out the conversation is that at SERP we do try our best to put out the information um to the community through our newsletter and we have over the last year also implemented a new blog. Uh, where we can have more quick posts about um, some findings that we have or different initiatives going on in the community that we think um, would be relevant or interest interesting to our audiences. So, um, you know, if any of these conversations have, you know, interested you as an audience to this podcast, then, you know, we would highly recommend um, everyone get connected to us through our, our newsletter. So subscribing to that newsletter means that um, people will get the up-to-date information. For each month, you'll get the email with our infographic when that publishes through CRN. Um, That's going to be an automatic email, and you'll see some of the more recent analyses that we've done. Um, Then there's also, of course, the um, announcements about any new blog posts that would be important to send out either immediately or just through the newsletter. Um, So that's a great way to stay connected with with SERP um, on on a monthly basis. In addition to, you know, just reaching out, we have a contact form on our website um, that has a lot of different options. If you have ideas for infographics, so say you um, are really interested in this particular analysis and you think data buddies would be a great fit um, for that, it, you can you can give us some ideas and then we'll be happy to um, pursue that for a, for a monthly infographic. Or perhaps you want to do your own. Um, at SERP, we offer opportunities for people to request a data set from us. So if you're interested in looking at Data Buddy's data yourself, you know, we have a form for that. <laughs> the website is really extensive on, for our Data Buddy, so definitely check it out. Um, so if you're interested in doing your own analysis, we, uh, we can provide a de-identified aggregate data for you to do your own analysis. And if you'd like to be a guest writer for an infographic and publish some of your own work, we um, happily invite people to do that. Yeah, that sounds great. So if you're interested, open the episode description of this episode. There will be a link in there. 
going to the SERP website. Uh, any final thoughts from you, Bertrand? Um, yeah, so I, I think um, one of the important things to um, kind of note is we have talked about all of these different projects and uh, connections to the community. I think I want to uh, make sure that we mention um, this is a team effort. And there are a lot of people involved in this, um, not just um, in terms of the SERP team, which is right now um, we have um, six um, staff members who are focusing on SERP, including Heather and myself. But we also have um, Evelyn Yarzabinski, who is our senior research associate, um, Christy Kelly, who is our research associate. Um, Tanaya Ross Dunmore, who is a research assistant right now, and we're also going to be joined by Ruhi Amir, who is going to be our program assistant. So this team works every day tirelessly, um, tries to be very flexible to try to serve the community and um, make all of this possible. But then we also work with um, a lot of the different um, colleagues at CRA. You know, when we work with CRWP, um, there's a lot of collaboration, organization, all of those go through. I mean, there have been times that we work with CCC and, of course, try and evaluate those programs, um, you know, what that involves. So uh, that's just a lot of work that goes into this. And even outside of CRA, we have collaborators that we do research with because we can't really do use the database data, for instance, only as, as Heather alluded to earlier, there's just time limitations. So um, that's important in making sure that what we do, all of the things that we do actually connect to the community closely. Um, and so we don't just work with CRWP or within CRA, we work with other BPC alliances. And this all um, it relies on really um, everyone's willingness to work together and recognize the importance of what we do, but also the resources that we provide um, and how we make those more effective. So I think um, I'd, I'd like to um, kind of make sure that we emphasize that. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for taking the time to speak with me today and, uh, you know, have a good one. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. That's it for this episode of Catalyze and Computing. We'll be back soon. Until then, remember to like, subscribe, and rate us five stars wherever you get your podcast. Learn more about the work of SERP and find their infographics at cra.org slash CERP. Learn more about the CCC and the podcast at cra.org slash CCC. Until next time, peace.